Great. So, yeah, this week, um, the title of um, my talk is Ident Identity and the No-Self Doctrine. Um, so you might wonder, I thought we were talking about internationality and Sangha, why are we talking about identity? Um, <clears throat> it's interested me for a, a good while, actually. Um, I remember being on um, an ordination course, a four-month uh, retreat where people are getting ordained and uh, in the process they move from being not ordained to being ordained and it's a wonderful thing it's a wonderful thing to see to witness because you see people change you see them change when they get ordained they change some of them more tangibly than others um, and it left me wondering what has happened because it's a shift in identity uh, there's something that shifts in their identity but what is it? What on earth is it? I couldn't for the life of me sort of put my finger on it, but I could see it sort of with my own eyes. So um, that's left me sort of reflecting on this area of identity. But linking it up with our theme, uh, I was watching Simon Sharma's History of America. Uh, what's it called? Uh, American Future uh, History. I think that's the title for episodes. And um, he talks about the American Revolution and the, and, and the sort of start of America, uh, where you've got all of these immigrants from different parts of uh, the world kind of coming together, uh, trying to create one united uh, kind of people, uh, one united sort of state. Um, and uh, of course, at that time, people were reflecting on how do we do that? Um, <clears throat> how do we actually kind of uh, create a united people? from a whole variety of immigrants um, uh, that have different sort of uh, ethnicity, different religious um, uh, background, uh, different cultural background. How do we actually do that? And uh, he was quote, quoting somebody called Hevker, so a French uh, man who's, who writes on the American Revolution. And he, what he says is, he says, this has never happened before. Uh, we've got people coming together on the basis of an idea, uh, not a common cultural heritage, co common religious heritage, um, <clears throat> but actually on the basis of an idea, the idea of liberty, uh, I think equality and fraternity. <laughs> um, and what he proposes is that actually uh, <coughs> the solution is to completely drop cultural identity. Uh, we can just completely drop that and we can just meet as free individuals. That's what he proposed. Um, so that's really interesting, isn't it? And there's, there's, a, there's a, an assumption about identity in that, that identity is just a sort of nothing. Um, cultural identity is a kind of nothing that we can literally forget about. It's an idea that we can just put aside um, uh, and relate in a different way. Um, so... Yeah, ideas about identity are kind of really um, crucial to any way we think about internationality and bringing different, different nationalities together. What actually is identity? What are we talking about? Um, <clears throat> uh, interestingly, then, he quotes um, in the same episode uh, somebody called Grace Abbott, who uh, doesn't agree, and she uh, proposes that uh, actually, identity, cultural identity, enriches, uh, will enrich the American culture. Uh, that's what she proposes. Um, so she presumably takes identity as something kind of real, intrinsic to uh, people and relation, uh, those people relating. It can't be put aside in the way that Ted uh, says it can be. So um, you might well think um, that the Buddha is on the side of Kevke because he talks about the no self doctrine. Uh, so surely uh, it's a nothing. Um, but when the Buddha was confronted by uh, Vacha Gotta, um, he, he used to get um, kind of confronted by these tricky characters that try and catch him out. And uh, I think Vacha Gotta is one of those. I didn't get enough time to read up about it, but I think he's one of those. And um, uh, he just asks the Buddha point blank, um, <clears throat> is there a self or not? <laughs> and the Buddha does not reply. 
the Buddha does not reply. Um, and that's not because the Buddha wasn't sure what the answer was or was confused. That is a deliberate sort of not replying. Um, <clears throat> so that's really interesting, isn't it? We've got the no self doctrine, but the Buddha refusing to say either uh, that there is no self or that there is a, that, that there is a self. Um, <clears throat> uh, so uh, one of Sangharakshita's teachers, uh, Jagdish Kashyap, um, who was uh, an Indian uh, scholar, uh, monk, he, um, he explains the no-self doctrine by looking at the teaching that it is refuting. So it's refuting a Hindu, the Hindu teaching of um, Atta or uh, Atman, um, that there is a fixed and enduring self. Uh, so Jagdish Kashyap said what the Buddha is getting at is that there is no fixed enduring self. Uh, that is the point. That is, um, that's how Jagdish Kashyap and, and Sangharakshita kind of followed him uh, in that tradition. Um, so in a way, that should answer it, but it hasn't for me. <laughs> it didn't for me. Uh, in a way, the penny sort of didn't quite drop. Um, um, <clears throat> but perhaps for you, it, it uh, does, in which case you can switch off at this point. Um, yeah, uh, but I think uh, that silence of the Buddha, um, I think a later teaching uh, that comes from a movement uh, in the Mahayana called the Yogacara, um, the Mahayana being a later development of Buddhism, um, uh, has a teaching called the Three Svabhavas. And I think that maybe the Three Svabhavas uh, actually give words to the Buddha's silence. Uh, they articulate what the Buddha's silence was uh, at that time, um, the only thing that could sort of respond to that question. Maybe I'm wrong, but that's what I think. Um, so uh, the three Svabhavas, uh, simply put, kind of um, uh, categorize three different levels of reality. Um, so absolute reality, relative reality, and illusory uh, reality, if you could have an illusory reality. Um, but they're often, they're usually translated instead of realities as natures, the three natures. Uh, so illusory uh, nature, relative nature, and absolute nature. So if we look at the self or identity through the, this category um, of sort of levels of existence or reality or natures, um, um, I think it starts to articulate the Buddha silence uh, a bit more fully. So um, yeah, by absolute, um, what is being got at is um, something that is not dependent on external factors, something that's not dependent on external factors. Because it's not dependent on external factors, uh, mm -hmm. it's unchanging. Yeah, in that way, it has an absolute uh, existence. So that's what's being got at by this, uh, this level. Um, So we can look at identity, uh, anything within identity, and sort of just analyze, is there anything in identity uh, that has an absolute uh, nature? Um, so if we look at something like gender, um, for example, uh, well, does it have an absolute nature? Um, so of course, gender, um, we could take anything, but let's take that. Um, Gender has arisen as, a, as an evolutionary leap forward, um, hasn't it, to, in order to um, diversify gene pools such that the species um, uh, is uh, more, uh, is, the future of the species is, 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 is more secured. Uh, that's what, so it's, it's just emerged out of conditions, hasn't it? Uh, it's amazing, isn't it? Here we are, different genders, but mm. back then, all, <laughs> all those years ago, uh, it was a sort of evolutionary kind of leap forward. So, um, and then, you know, gender these days, well, uh, is it a fixed thing? People people are sort of trying to pin, pin it down, aren't they? What is it? What actually is it? Um, <clears throat> but actually gender roles have sort of uh, shifted, uh, haven't they, through time? It doesn't seem to be 
entirely sort of pinned downable. It seems to change somewhat on the basis uh, of conditions. So um, if we take anything, so that's just looking at gender. If we take anything um, that we could identify as me, um, we can't find anything that is uh, that has an absolute nature. Everything, our bodies, um, <clears throat> are all kind of conditioned processes. Uh, there's nothing that is uh, absolutely independent um, of conditions. Um, our minds are kind of constantly uh, changing and in flux. There's nothing that can be found in the self uh, that is absolute. So um, that's the, the first nature, um, <clears throat> the absolute. Um, uh, then let's jump to the third, illusory. Um, you could think because there's nothing uh, that's absolute about identity, then it must be an illusion. It, uh, that's what Krevka is kind of, that's the jump that he's making, isn't it? Um, that it must be an illusion. Um, and the Buddha didn't go along with that because if you say that uh, self, the self is an identity is an illusion, um, you undermine what supports um, personal responsibility, taking personal responsibility uh, or ethical agency um, for how we act. Uh, if there is no self, then who uh, can take responsibility for? your actions. <laughs> so the Buddha didn't want to, he didn't go along with that, he wouldn't go along with that, um, that the self is illusory. Um, but there's more to uh, this, uh, this aspect because um, <clears throat> of what we heard um, Kashyapji to, to say. So there is something about uh, identity that is illusory, the idea that it is fixed, it is absolute, that is wholly illusory. If we think of ourselves as we tend to, as a fixed identity, there is nothing that you can find that corresponds to that. So that idea is wholly illusory, it's wholly made up, uh, it's merely an illusion. Uh, what we, uh, so yeah, um, if we look at our, we look at ourselves. We're kind of constantly um, uh, in that illusion. Um, we think of that about ourselves, but actually about other people. When you find yourself getting angry uh, with someone, uh, you find them in your fourth stage. Um, it's because you are reducing them to a sort of fixed and definite person. You can see it in the language. You know, he's always doing this. Uh, he never does that. It's all absolute language. Always never uh he's never going to change uh, do you see what i mean we're sort of fixing that person and that is what we do if we get into that relationship of aversion uh, you sort of refuse to acknowledge that they could change that there are different aspects to them. we sort of reduce them down um to a, a kind of absolute bad person <laughs> um so that's kind of yeah that's an underlying tendency of our ordinary consciousness. So what we find in conclusion is that actually identity, uh, the self, is uh, relative. Um, <clears throat> it only has relative reality. So how do you feel about that, uh, that we're all just relatively real? Uh, <laughs> it's a bit of a funny feeling, isn't it? What does that mean? Uh, Alan wanted to call this talk, are you really real? Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah, so that seems to be the case. Uh, but what that it's not saying we're not really here. That's not the point. Um, <clears throat> we are experiencing what we're experiencing. It's not it's not questioning that. Um, what it is saying is that everything uh, that we experience is dependent on conditions. Um, Everything in our in our identity is uh, arises from conditions, um, <clears throat> and actually some of those conditions are quite arbitrary. You know, I am the way I am simply because I was born in England. You know, I never chose that. Uh, so is that really me? Uh, <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, 
and even then kind of what is English uh, as I was saying before we can't really sort of pin it down we can't quite pin it down it's some it's a sort of conditioned arising it only has a sort of relative reality so that's what's being that's what's being said here not that it doesn't exist uh, but that it only has a sort of relative reality um, so there we are those are the three uh, um, three skabavas the three natures absolute relative and usually um, but how does this help us um, make more sense of what identity is, think more helpfully uh, about identity? Um, <clears throat> well, what is being suggested, um, at least in this context, um, by this teaching is uh, that we can't make absolute statements about identity. Uh, so absolute statements are just not in accord with the nature of identity yeah absolute statements are kind of not in accord with the nature of identity um <clears throat> yeah so if you know uh you see you see quite a lot of this about don't you uh you see it in the news um uh, people saying well um uh, british people <laughs> um but actually if we really look at what does that mean where do you draw the line you know uh I mean, the British are a sort of mongrel nation anyway. Uh, what do we? What are we actually talking about? But people using that term as a sort of absolute distinction to 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 you know where yeah to draw a line between some people and other other people. It just doesn't it doesn't kind of work. So there's a lot of use of sort of um, absolute language, absolute terms, absolute distinctions um, in the area of identity. Uh, if we look at gender. Um, you know, if you take um, male and female as sort of absolute um, uh, sort of uh, categories, then uh, there's no such thing as non-binary. Um, there's no space for that. How could there be? Because, you know, uh, we're either men or women. You see what I mean? Um, similarly, uh, non-binary, if you made that an absolute, then there's no such thing as men and women. So, um can you see how absolute statements are just really, really unhelpful when it comes to identity? Uh, but there's quite a lot of that uh, going on at the moment. What will actually happen is as soon as you start making absolute statements about identity, uh, you will deny the identity of someone else and they will not be happy about that. And that's what we're seeing, isn't it? We're seeing kind of uh, in various areas, this sort of quite polarized um, sort of discourse um, because of these sort of absolute uh, terms, these absolute sort of uh, ways of relating to identity. So yeah, in a nutshell, um, what's being said is that with identity, um, you can't absolutely dismiss it, uh, nor can you um, make sort of absolute assertions about it. Um, <clears throat> So this is the number bit. What's being suggested by this, this sort of middle category uh, that earlier Buddhism doesn't really sort of have um, is uh, that we need to relate to identity differently. We can't relate to identity uh, as an absolutely existent thing, nor as an absolutely non-existent thing. We need to find a new way of relating to identity. Uh, I think it's something that Buddhism uh, has really got to offer um, the modern world uh, this. Um, another way of putting that is that we need to learn to hold identity lightly. That's the new kind of relationship as opposed to sort of this is who I am and uh, that's who you are. Uh, you need to be able to hold identity lightly. So it seems that uh, Krebke is wrong. Uh, it seems uh, not to be true. Um, it seems that the identity does have a reality, but it's just a particular reality. It's a rel relative uh, reality. So his point that it's just an idea and we can forget about it seems just seems wrong. It doesn't seem to be true. Um, 
So let's sort of bring this down into experience because quite it's quite sort of abstract, isn't it? Um, uh, so what we're really talking about in this um, this change of attitude, this kind of need to relate to identity differently, is sangha. That's what sangha really is. Um, <clears throat> sangha, the third jewel of Buddhism, uh, and that's why internationality uh, is valuable. Is valuable uh, international context. It's valuable to uh, to sangha. Um, so. Uh, a little example of this, um, I was thinking about um, a friend of mine who was who uh, I was interviewing um, last week, Akshaya Deep, who was born in India. Um, and we've been friends for about 20 years or so. Or so. Um, and uh, a few years ago, we had this, for me, really important conversation. Um, where we were talking about the sort of different approaches uh, to friendship, actually, um, of uh, his and mine. <laughs> and we were expressing uh, our dismay. <laughs> um, he was expressing his dismay at how um, in England, in the, uh, I'll sit with England, uh, me basically was talking about uh, <laughs> how, um, a friend could, uh, if if another friend turns up at the door spontaneously, um, unannounced, uh, uh, how a friend could not respond uh, with um, dropping whatever they're doing and kind of welcoming uh, welcoming the friend in, you know, uh, cooking for them. That that for him was a sort of point of utter dismay because that's so natural uh, to Indian culture um, and Indian approaches to uh, friendship. So he was expressing his. His dismay, which is, you know, it was lovely exchange, very, very sort of honest, um, uh, but also really, really listening to each other. Uh, I was expressing my dismay. It's, I was saying, well, um, uh, how do you um, actually ever develop friendship if any um, um, planned date to get together uh, could be changed at the last minute mm -hmm. uh, you know how do you ever you know actually meet up enough to get to know each other to be friends you know uh, I was expressing my sort of dismay at that and um, yeah it's a really as I say it's really stuck in my memory as an, as an experience um, of uh, sangha of communication deeper communication um, and what came out of it um, <clears throat> was um just the cultural differences uh so um in the west largely your your security is an individual matter your financial security uh your health um your social security it's all sort of institutionalized you can go to these institutions you know you're looked after in india that's not the case in india uh, your social security is your friends your, and your family. Your financial security is your friends and your family. Um, your what's the other one I mentioned? Anyway, it's all your friends and your family, basically. Um, so that means that anything happens, you're um, to you. You are drawn together by circumstance, by uh, necessity. It draws you together. In the West, it draws us apart. It draws us apart. So in the West. You need to commit time aside from looking after your financial, social, uh, health, security to you need to carve out time to make friends. Uh, that's the way it works largely because your life is going to draw you away from your friends. Uh, but in India, it works the other way around. Don't worry about the plans you make because because life in India is unpredictable and it is going to at some point require require something of your friends so life the nature of life in india draws people together so it draws people together so um that was sort of what we realized as a consequence of sort of exploring this and uh, what was wonderful about it was um just saying oh my goodness my assumptions about how friendship works um how to approach approach friendship are entirely conditioned they're just relative it just arises from the environment uh, that i'm in and so too for him uh, this sort of initial dismay is to but you know how could that possibly you know how could you possibly sort of 
uh, be friends like that, but from on both sides. Um, but what was what was uh, wonderful about it was that um, I don't get those sorts of assumptions uh, exposed as relative, uh, you know, in their nature as kind of relative uh, by my English friends. We're just like, well, yeah, that's how you go about it. <laughs> um, and it sort of, it, um, it how, to, how to put it, it sort of undermined, um, well, it, it showed me, it gave me an experience of how relative, how, how relative my identity and how I approach life is. And there I was left with this other person uh, who's, you know, just the same, just as relative. Um, and um, actually what Buddhism is saying is that there isn't a, really a distinction. Uh, they're not entirely separate levels of reality, absolute and relative. It's more like when you see the relative as relative, uh, the absolute somehow kind of shines through. So there was something, um, the absolute or the unconditioned, there was something that kind of shone through in that moment that was more than just seeing, oh, look, we're sort of different, but differently made up, if you see what I mean. Uh, there was something of common humanity, the, our common humanity that really just sort of um, shone through as a consequence of having all my assumptions just sort of pulled away from me. I was just left as a human being uh, more fully, um, more naked, as it were, than I am even with my sort of English uh, friends. It's a wonderful sort of experience. Um, but that's what's being got at. Um, but actually, if we can really sort of uh, embrace the relative nature uh, of our identity, you see, uh, feel, experience uh, our common humanity. And that's what can happen in an international context, we can be challenged, pushed up against assumptions that we're making that, other, that our own culture won't necessarily get to. Um, but what can come from that is this deeper experience of what we most fundamentally share. So, just moving on, uh, so we had Grace Abbott saying internationality enriches. Um, and I just want to explore that a little bit as well. Um, is that absolutely true? <laughs> um, so um, if I look at my sense of, you know, this common, what's common to us, um, our common humanity, I have to admit that it's actually pretty fragile um, in my own experience. Uh, it's not too difficult. Even having those sorts of conversations with good friends that I've been friends with for a year, I need to be kind of quite careful about how I enter that territory. It's very, very easy to, we've got that word getting triggered, haven't we? Um, and then when you get triggered, the, your friend gets, you know, and you get into that, that kind of two-way thing. Very, very easy. Um, for that to happen, um, for us to be based in what divides us, um, based in a fixed sense of self um, <clears throat> and a fixed sense of other, and not based in that common humanity. Um, and uh, it doesn't seem to be just me that that is the ca that's the case for. Uh, if we look at what happens in those awful scenarios of genocides, kind of cultural genocides, where neighbours who got on fine suddenly are murdering um, each other's families. Um, it's fragile. Our, our kind of sense uh, of common humanity is kind of fragile. It's a fragile thing. Um, <clears throat> so it seems to be not absolutely true that internationality inevitably enriches. Um, yes, it can do, can't it? Um, but it's not, it's not an absolute either. And so this is one of the reasons why I'm a Buddhist, um, that um, uh, Buddhism, one thing Buddhism does is it helps us uh, develop a positive identity. Uh, so actually, that's interesting, isn't it, that we need to develop a positive identity 
in order to loosen um, our sort of rigidity uh, to kind of holding on to identity. Um, I, hope that, I hope that sort of makes sense. Um, I could have put that in a simple way, but anyway, I think you probably get the idea. So a little example for me was, uh, um, I, uh, I left England uh, to go to France when I was 19. Um, I couldn't think of one good thing about England at, the, mm -hmm. <laughs> at that age. I just thought England is the pits, you know. Uh, <laughs> we're not kind of lively and passionate, you know, like the, mm -hmm. the Latins. We're not kind of uh, efficient like the Germans. We're, you know, what are we? You know, I couldn't think of one positive thing. And uh, uh, I later became a Buddhist and um, a, a New Zealander who was very, very helpful to me at uh, that time. You know, he started saying positive things about the English and I was like, all right, <laughs> that's interesting. <laughs> and I started to develop, develop a kind of liking for Shakespeare, liking interest in Shakespeare, sort of valuing a, a pride, I suppose, uh, in Shakespeare. And that had a very positive effect on me. Because, of course, our cultural identity is our sort of self-identity, actually, as well. We can't sort of, you can't have a negative, entirely negative sort of cultural identity and a, a positive sort of self-identity. Um, so, yeah, the more I developed that, actually, the, the lighter I could hold my own identity. Uh, so, actually, in some ways, we need to develop our, our, a positive identity. Uh, many of us need to sort of develop a positive identity in order to be able to hold our identity sort of more lightly. Um, <clears throat> so that's the, that's one thing Buddhism sort of helps us, uh, can help us do. Um, but the thing is, uh, it's not enough. That's not enough because uh, the gravitational pull of ordinary consciousness is towards fixity, is towards sort of absolutizing uh, our identity. Yeah, we're always sort of pulled in that direction, um, <clears throat> uh, settling into a kind of solid, solidified self. Even in your spiritual life, that tendency is at play. Uh, that is just the gravitational pull of ordinary consciousness. Um, it's as though we have a desire for the absolute, for something absolute, for something we can fundamentally rely on. Uh, but we just misattribute that to the relative nature of identity. Uh, that's what we seem to do. Um, <clears throat> and it seems like we need, um, because... Uh, because our sense of common, you know, what's common in humanity is kind of quite fragile, uh, we seem to need, um, or at least if we acknowledge the presence of something absolute, we can identify that in some sort of way, enlightenment. Um, well, then actually that helps us uh, um, <clears throat> hold more lightly to the relative nature of identity. Yeah. So we need something, we seem to, or what Buddhism offers in part is that um, some sort of uh, way of coming into fuller relationship with uh, something absolute, uh, which is beyond words, uh, enlightenment, um, this potential we all have in consciousness common to all humanity. Um, if we can get a stronger sense of that, then we can actually hold our identity um, more likely, uh, we can actually accept, embrace the relative nature of identi our identity, i.e. we can kind of grow and change. And that's what I was seeing. That's what happens. Um, that's what happened in that moment when I was seeing people get ordained. Their identity was moving, was shifting from a fixed identity to a relative identity. It was a shift in how they hold their identity. Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, perhaps just finishing off. Um, yeah, uh, that this uh, that sort of shift to holding identity more lightly in a relative kind of way is, um, as I said, it's the nature of sangha. It's what sangha. 
kind of is. Um, um, so you move from sort of ordinary consciousness to the consciousness of an individual, a true individual. A true individual is sort of the gravitational pull of a true individual is um, actually that uh, relative uh, identity. Um, that's the gravitational pull. Even if you sort of solidify your pulls drawn back to um, primarily, primarily uh, experiencing um, and relating to your self-identity others in that relative kind of way. So, um, yeah, just a last uh, point. Um, one way of thinking about this is uh, to think of it in terms of a mandala. Um, so has everybody heard of the term mandala? So that's a mandala. Uh, so this sort of um, arrangement around a central point, a central principle, a central absolute. So that's a sort of image for the psyche, um, for a, uh, something absolute. Um, and uh, at ordination, you're kind of placing that as central. Uh, that is the central um, sort of reliance, if you like, of your life. Uh, that's cent most centrally what it means to be human. Um, and what that means is that you sort of arrange your identity, then arranges sort of around that, as it were. It all comes into relationship uh, with that. So that's the sense in which identity is a kind of harmonious, increasingly as you grow, it's a harmonious a sort of arrangement around um, what is absolute in consciousness. So um, what that, examples of that are, for example, Akshay Deep. Akshay Deep has in a way become more Indian uh, since I've known him. Um, yeah. And he's more Indian as a friend uh, than he used to be. Uh, so our identity, our qualities start to sort of um, emerge uh, and, and take fuller expression, actually, um, <clears throat> if uh, they are arranged around something absolute. Um, yeah, I've... I've, um, in some ways, I mean, I'm reading Milton's Paradise Lost. There's something that is expressed in that about, I mean, I'm reading it because it's English and it's it, and um, because he was English and expresses something. It touches my heart in a way that, that um, other things can't sort of get to. I mean, I'm reading, reading Camus, who's, a, who's Algerian as well, and that really moves me. But there's something... Uh, particular that is expressed by that uh, that really goes deep um, with me uh, for me uh, but it's in relation somehow it's building this sort of more positive identity around a kind of uh, absolute um, <clears throat> so um Sometimes the image of a mandala is also used to uh, mean a, a, a community, a community of people, not just an individual, but a community. It can mean sangha, um, uh, a mandala. You could call it, you could talk about the Cambridge man mandala. Um, <clears throat> and uh, what I find interesting about that is that uh, each different sort of um, Sangers, you know, Cambridge, London, Sheffield, uh, uh, Berlin, uh, Melbourne, um, uh, Cuernavaca, <laughs> Mexico <laughs> City, they've all got distinct uh, identities, actually, um, in a very positive, uh, it's, it's a lovely uh, thing. We did this thing on when we were in lockdown, where we went and visited different Sangers, and it was it was, you could just feel it immediately that, you know, there was something recognizably familiar and there was something utterly distinctive about each of those different uh, sanghas. So actually, um, as a community, we have a distinct identity. And I wonder, I think that, that uh, part of that identity is internationality. I think in Cambridge, um, 
uh, Cambridge is um, quite an international place. Um, and so I, I want to sort of throw that out there, actually, as maybe that is something of the character uh, of our, our identity. And we need to sort of welcome that, embrace that, and learn how to um, how to make that kind of um, quality shine uh, more and more. Um, so that was that was where I wanted to sort of uh, leave uh, this particular. I've got some questions for the groups, but we just come up to uh, up to tea breaks. So I hope that's uh, been stimulating for you, and we'll explore further in the groups shortly. Mm -hmm.